Well, my name is Andrew Curry. Uh, I'm a pastor in a small church in Ireland. And uh, I've been asked if I would come and speak a little bit about some of the issues that come when you're trying to create a prayer culture within your church and how to try and encourage that. It's amazing what you can find online. One of the things I found was an obituary for Mrs. Prayer Meeting. It reads, Mrs. Prayer Meeting died recently at the first neglected church on Worldly Avenue. Born many years ago in the midst of great revivals, she was a strong and healthy child, fed largely on testimony and Bible study. She soon grew into worldwide prominence and was one of the most influential members of the famous church family. For the past several years, Mrs. Prayer Meeting has been feeling in health, gradually wasting away until rendered helpless by stiffness of knees, coldness of heart, inactivity and weakness of purpose and willpower. At the last, she was but a shadow of her former happy self. Her last whispered words were inquiries concerning the strange absence of her loved ones, now so busy in the markets of trade and places of worldly amusements. Experts, including Dr. Works, Dr. Reform, and Dr. Joyner, disagreed as to the cause of her fatal illness. They'd administered large doses of organizations, socials, contests, and drives, but to no avail. A post-mortem showed that a deficiency of spiritual food coupled with a lack of faith, heartfelt religion, and general support were contributing causes. Only a few were present at her death sobbing over memories of her past beauty and power. In honour of her going, the church doors will be closed on Wednesday nights, except the third Wednesday night of each month when the Ladies' Pink Lemonade Society will serve refreshments to the men's soccer team. Well, if you've been in church ministry any length of time or you've been around a church and, and watched it over years, you know too often the sad story plays its way out in our, our churches. The prayer meeting, the, the time of corporate prayer where God's people will come together and appeal to him to work in the life of the congregation and in the needy lostness of the area is very often the first uh, aspect of church life to get neglected. It's the hardest graft for the, the preacher to try and convince people to come and to give themselves to prayer. Why is it that people find it so hard, that they do find it so hard, to prioritize the prayer meeting? Well, C.H. Spurgeon preached a sermon at one point titled, Only a Prayer Meeting. Only a prayer meeting. It was a very clever title. He was prone to do that. But a very clever title because it highlighted the age-old attitude in the church. We, we have within the church a very quickly set in apathy towards corporate prayer. And yet that's in complete contrast to all that you've been studying already, all that scripture says about the, the importance of the place of prayer. Our people need to be convinced otherwise. And it's you, the preacher, and the pastor, that is able to, to, to do just that. We, we need to communicate to our people that really a lack of prayer is a sign of a lack of faith. A lack of prayer is a sign of a lack of faith. Jesus had to, at one point in his ministry, address the reason that his soon-to-be apostles, his disciples, were struggling to make spiritual progress. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verse 28 and 29. They, 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 they've been trying to do something for the cause of the kingdom, and it hadn't worked. And Jesus says, Mark chapter 9, verse 28, And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? Speaking of 
the, the demon that had possessed the boy. Verse 29, Jesus said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. In other words, the removal of this demon from this child it was something that would only be accomplished through prayerfulness, through the activity of prayer. Now, what does that imply about the disciples up to this particular moment? What does that tell us about their techniques up to this point? Well, very simply, they tried absolutely everything they could, except prayer, except prayer. They hadn't prayed. They hadn't even thought of praying. And what did that lack of prayer reveal about the disciples at that particular moment? What did it reveal about their spiritual position at that particular moment? Well, Jesus said earlier in the chapter when the event was occurring, Mark chapter 9, verse 19, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? O faithless generation. In other words, the disciples and the people had failed to pray because they lacked faith. And that's a, an important verdict on our lack of enthusiasm for corporate prayer in the church. Why do we lack enthusiasm in our churches for corporate prayer? Because we lack faith. We, 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 we lack sincere belief that only God can change things. We lack sincere belief that God loves to hear the prayers of his children and is moved by them. We, 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 the, our apathy towards corporate prayer in the church declares something about our belief in God's engagement in the current affairs of life. In John chapter 15, verse Five, Jesus declares, apart from me, you can do nothing. If his words are true, and they are, then how can we in the church attempt anything that, that's going to be spiritually successful? How can we attempt anything without prayer? Without prayer. Our people need to know this. Attendance at the corporate prayer time is a non-verbal declaration that I am not leaning on my own strength. Our church is not leaning on our ingenuity, but instead we need the Lord. It's an awareness of our helplessness. It's an awareness of our dependence upon him that drives God's people to their knees. Now, people need to know as well that prayer is, prayer is part of our spiritual warfare. Now, we, we as uh, pastors and preachers need to be continually reminding them that, that we wage war not simply against earthly things, but against the spiritual. And so we need to be a praying people, appealing for that help from above. Our people need to know and be reminded that the, that the faithful through the generations and as expressed the early church and the New Testament were, were a people who, who were committed to prayer. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, they devoted themselves, this early church, to certain components. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the Lord's table, and the prayers, the prayers. Our people need to be told and reminded often that prayer works, that prayer does work. And they need to know why it works. Why is it that prayer does make a difference? They need to be told often that, that the character of God is moved by the prayers of his people. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 says, And I, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one that knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have a God who who loves to hear the prayers of his children and, and works through the prayers of his children. We were told very explicitly at the end there, Oh, of verse 13, that, 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 that he gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. The Holy Spirit in the New Testament is a very clear ministry, an expansive ministry, but a very clear and real ministry in the life of the believer. We're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The Spirit is the means by which we put to death the deeds of the body. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit's work in our life that ultimately kills and mortifies sin. We can pray for that work of the Spirit to take place in our life. That that we can pray and, and... Sins hold on us, be be slain, be mortified. You think of the fruit of the Spirit described there in Galatians 6. No, no, not only does the Holy Spirit remove our uh, and kill our sinfulness, but he produces in us this godly character. This character that that that, that is needed. You are not self-controlled, we can pray to the Spirit. That he would do that work, that that work would take place in us. The Spirit would work to craft within us self-control. How many Christians in our congregation battle with a lack of assurance? Well, we've been told we can pray for the Spirit and his work to take place in our lives. And and God answers that prayer. But Romans chapter 8 verse 16 reminds us that part of that Spirit's work It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It's the Spirit's work to grant assurance in the heart of the believer. And we can pray as struggling individuals to God and ask that that Spirit's work would take place in our life. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 it speaks of uh, how the, the, the power to evangelize, to witness. This was a, 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 a work that was born out of the Holy Spirit's action in the life of the early church believers. God's word has told us this is what the Spirit does. And prayer lets us come and ask, God, would, would you do that work that the Spirit does in my life? The pure and Thomas Manton He talked about how to pray and encouraged his congregants to to show God his writing. Show God his writing, for our God is tethered to his word. In prayer, we bring the the words of scripture to God. Mortify my sin. Grant me that assurance. Grow that self-control that is needed. Empower me to evangelize, for the word says. We show him his writing, and God works. Uh, Indeed, we can have confidence as we pray to him. In John chapter 1, verse 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. You have not because you ask not. Our people need to be reminded that we can come with all of these spiritual needs to God with the confidence of scripture and ask him to do that work in us. 
Our people need to know that. And our people need to know that God most cares and most is moved to action through corporate prayer, especially. Corporate prayer is another level in terms of the way it affects the divine to act. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Uh, we read, I, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, contextually, he's talking about uh, a context of church discipline, a very difficult moment in the life of a, of a gathered church. Serious, important for the health of the church. And yet he says in that particular context where there's chaos and difficulty and those moments, if you've experienced them in church life, are very hard to navigate. And yet he says, if we agree together before him, he will move and he will operate in a special way. And indeed, even the language of that first, though it is in the context of of, uh, church discipline, is not limited in wording to that. The promise is, is not simply one when we agree regarding how to move forward in an issue of church discipline. It says if we agree about anything. This is a, a promise attached to agreement. The idea is where there's harmonious uh, 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 agreement, where, where we together speak. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's really the... Um, The amen of the people. That prayer is my prayer. Amen. Let it be, Lord. Uh, We agree, Lord. And our Lord is moved to action by that through the prayers of his people in agreement. And our people need to be reminded that prayer is what Christians do. Prayer is what Christians do. In fact, I think pastors, we need to be reminded the Christian heart is one that is shaped to pray. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56, let me read from verse 3. It says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh say, Yahweh will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give my house, and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to minister to him, and to love the name of Yahweh, To be his slaves, every one who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and takes hold of my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them glad in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer. For all the peoples. And those earlier verses that we read there remind us that the old covenant, the the Old Testament system had barriers. It put foreigners on the outside. Eunuchs could not come within. But but, but, But the new covenant that is being spoken of here is one of inclusion. These people will have space. These people will be brought in. These people will be able to engage once excluded and able to engage in the, uh, fully in the aspects of worship. But notice how this prediction about the glory of the inclusiveness of the new covenant, notice how it speaks about the mark of the new covenant people. Their worship will be marked by something. What is it? Well, it's by prayer, corporate prayer. They will come and dwell together in the house of prayer. Corporate prayer is that quality, that worship mark of the new covenant. 
The new covenant people are distinguished in Scripture by their corporate praying. Remember in Acts, whenever um, Saul is, is, has his Damascus Road experience, and, and God has his worker, Ananias, and he tells Ananias to go and to visit Paul. Ananias is, is fearful. What does God say? He assures him, saying, Behold, he prays. Behold, he prays. In other words, the evidence that Saul had become Paul, that he had been truly converted, was that he had become a man who gives himself to prayer. Prayer is the heart of the Christian. The Christian heart wants to pray and wants especially to pray with others. Um, Spurgeon in his sermon, only a prayer meeting. He talks in the context of that sermon about Peter and how Peter had been in prison. And remember, God miraculously delivers him. When Peter gets out, he goes to the house. Remember the servant girl, Rhoda, comes and opens the door and then runs away again before eventually letting him in. A speculative Spurgeon. He allows his mind to wonder and he says, how did Peter know where to go? How did he know where to go? Well, he looked at his watch and he saw it's 7.30 Wednesday night. It's time for a prayer meeting. And he went to where he knew the church would meet to pray. Why? Because a heart that loves God and is walking in fellowship with God yearns to pray with God's people. A heart that doesn't want to pray is not healthy in its relationship with God or its relationship uh, uh, with God's people. A heart that is cold to the things of prayer is cold. Now that has massive pastoral implications for us. You can't organize people to prayer. The organization can be helpful, knowing an order of what we're going to do can be helpful, but ultimately this isn't a, an organizing work, it's a spiritual work. It's a spiritual work. And God's people yearn to pray. They, 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 they want to pray, and when they don't, there's a deeper spiritual work needed in their life. They're becoming cold. That, 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 that flame needs to be fanned. So God's people will want to pray, especially as they are spiritually healthy and there is a, a spiritual war going on. But when they are healthy, when they are doing well, their heart longs because there are new covenant people to pray with other Christian people. Now, let me give you just five uh, tips for trying to encourage people to pray in the context of the church. And uh, I found this in a very helpful article online. Uh, there's lots of good stuff out there that you can find as well. But, but when it comes to thinking through your congregation, you've got to realize they're not, uh, they're not pastors, they're not preachers. And, and often the things that don't uh, worry us does sit as a real worry in the life of many in the congregation. Many people, especially if they're newly converted, panic in prayer times because they don't know the etiquette. They, 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 how do I know if it's my turn to pray or not? How, how do I know or what do I do if someone starts at the same time as me? And that idea causes them to freeze. Maybe it's the speaking itself that becomes such a burden. What am I going to say? How do you start? Um... Is, is there a pattern I'm meant to follow here? Um, what if I don't say things properly? Um, what if somebody else prays for the very thing I was about to pray for? Then what the, do I do? There's a lot of what ifs. What if I say something stupid? 
You know, what, what, what if I start talking and I forget completely what I was going to say? What if I don't know how to stop? I get, get start going and I don't know how to get out of this. And then, of course, not only are those, those normal human aspects of just speaking out loud in public that can be intimidating for people, also you add to that the accusations that so often in the prayer time come to the mind. You've been so sinful this week. You just want to look good before others. That's the only reason you want to pray. You're a hypocrite. Do you really think you can lead others in this prayer time? These are the thoughts and feelings that, that, that come uh, across the mind of our people. So how do we help them with that? Well, here's our tips. First of all, we, we want them to remember who they are in Christ. To remind them of who they are in Christ. That you are a greatly loved child, loved by your heavenly Father. And like any good father, he, in fact, even more than any good father, he loves his children and he wants to hear you talk to them. They need to know that. You are a sinner. That is true. Those accusations, you are a sinner. You are not pure. But remember, you've been saved by the grace of God. Jesus' work has, has purchased you. He died on the cross for you to open up a, a living way back to the presence of God. That sin that's holding you back from praying right now, leave it at the cross. Remember, friend, you're a temple of, of, of you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is living in you. And, and he's working through you. And he can do anything. You can't, but he can. And he can use even your feeble words to lead your brothers and sisters in this room in prayer. They need to be reminded of who they are in Christ. Secondly, we need to encourage them to learn from their brothers and sisters. I think it's just such a helpful thing when, when somebody does come and share to you that, that nervousness or even you, can, you just know they're nervous. To encourage them to, to listen to, to those older saints. Do you hear how they pray? Do you hear how they address God? Well, well, do you notice what they said thank you for? Do you notice the kind of things they're asking God for? And do you, do you notice how they finish their prayers? Push them to the models of more mature uh, brothers and sisters who've been doing this a, a long time. Thirdly, encourage them, please, to, to, to join in, not to let their mind drift off. In other words, when somebody else is praying in the room, they need to get into their mind that this is their prayer. Their prayer. That person's talking, but, but they're, you're also praying. We, 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 we bring our mind uh, into it. We think carefully about the things that are being said. Some churches, you actually do a loud yes or an amen or a, in Ireland, we give a kind of a holy hum at that particular point. The power of the amen at the end. Let it be, Lord. That prayer is my prayer. You encourage them to tune in, to see what others are saying is theirs, and to pray with. I think fourthly, you can encourage them to plan their prayer. I've done this several times with individuals who've been especially newly saved in the church and very nervous, don't know if they trust themselves to open their mouth. Allow them to, to write down some bullet points or even to write out the whole prayer for the first few times. Encourage them to do that. So they can pick up their, the, what they have written, knowing that it makes sense, knowing that the thoughts they want to express on behalf of the church family is there in front of them and they can read it out. They can read it out. And then I think, fifthly, just encourage them to go for it. Um, you, they have to know and sometimes be pushed to do it. And tell them, hey, look, if, if, if you go silent or if you get interrupted, it doesn't matter. It's a good, if somebody else starts the same time as you, it doesn't matter. Stop, 
Let the other person pray and we'll all give space for you to pray next. It's not a performance. It's a conversation with your heavenly father. And when we talk, we interrupt each other all the time, don't we? We start sometimes at the same time. We interrupt. Sometimes we even go silent a little bit as we think about what we're saying next. Prayer is talking to God. So those are the tips I would press upon people. I think there's just some general things as well we can say in our churches. And the pastor, preacher, you are the model. You are the model and you need to model prayer. Your prayers are important. Uh, the call to worship and the prayer that follows, uh, that's important. But that intercessory prayer, maybe in the middle of the service, that's extremely important. Uh, in times of gathered prayer, don't just leave it to the church to pray. You insist on praying every time. Maybe you're an associate in the church. As a senior pastor, the most annoying thing is whenever you're at a prayer time and the associate pastor hasn't prayed. Uh, he at least should be praying uh, because it allows him to be a model of prayer to others and uh, 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 prayer in and of itself is important. When you go on pastoral visits, hospital visits, home visits, and every single one in prayer, do not leave that room until you have prayed. You have an influence in the youth and children's ministry in the church. Encourage them to make prayer a priority, an important part of their program. Don't let it be squashed out. Encourage often from the pulpit families to be praying together. For fathers especially to be praying with, with, with their families to lead them in prayer. Stress often this special privilege of corporate prayer. I think our, our people are very, uh, they, 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 very quick to see that prayer is important and they give themselves to private prayer. But they're very slow to see the blessing of corporate prayer. And they see lots of obstacles there. And so we need to, especially in our announcements and the way we engage with church, to, 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 to raise the significance in the mind of the people, the, the special privilege that is ours, to pray corporately. I think as part of that, you don't let any evangelistic outreach the ministry starting up in the spring or the fall, or even a sermon in church, you don't let any of that take place without it first being brought to the Lord in prayer. The pre-service prayer time, a special time of prayer before the works commence or before the mission, the evangelistic mission takes place. Mark it by prayer so the people understand over time that, that our pastor believes we need to pray if God is going to work. And I think as well, thank people, especially when they pray for the first few times, or you hear them pray after you uh, a long gap where we haven't heard them pray for months. Make sure they know you appreciate their prayer. Thank them for praying, especially if it's for you or for the health of the church. Thank them, we need we need that partnership in the gospel. Thank them for bringing that need, your need, before the Lord. Again, I mentioned at the very beginning, Spurgeon said and labeled his sermon, only a prayer meeting. Only a prayer meeting. That's what so many people have in their head. It's just a prayer meeting. It's just a prayer meeting. They don't really need me there. That's not the point. And we should be emphasizing, shouldn't we? Only a prayer meeting to see God work in this world. That's all it takes. We need Him. We need Him. And it only takes the prayer meeting before we see Almighty God moving amongst us. Uh, let me encourage you. It's not an easy thing. It's so quickly neglected. And it's hard to encourage people towards that, which says Satan is actively discouraging them towards. We need, to, we need to plead, wrestle, encourage our people 
be a praying people and to take every opportunity we can to do just that.